Okay, now we're recording, I believe. And uh, so we've, we are now, I'm gonna continue to do these Zooms because <laughs> for something like 16 years, people that live in Manhattan have been asking me to do this. And I always <laughs> say, no, nah, I'm not gonna do this. I don't like, you know, I don't, this has got to be spontaneous. This has to be, you know, me doing my stand-up routine. And uh, it's no fun to, to, to do this if it isn't live. And it turns out that it's just fine. So, yeah, and they're recorded for posterity. So anybody can look them up. We will one day get back to live, uh, live in-person stuff, but I think I'm going to continue to, to do these as well. Uh, so uh, basically we've already done the algae workshop and actually our, our buddy Josh did an addendum. So we have two algae workshops recorded. We did the, uh, the, the conditioning and the spawning uh, workshop. We've done the larval rearing workshop. So uh, if you missed any of those and you want to go back, they are on our website. They're, they're posted. Darcy's still taking good care of us and because I'm still incompetent about certain things. Uh, how's the audio? Is the audio working okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah, you're loud and clear. Oh, good, good, good. Because I made a mistake there on the one of the I fixed it right at the end of the first workshop where I discovered that I had a, a, a little Bluetooth speaker on that screwed everything up. So I guess we're in better shape. So this, this lecture or this PowerPoint uh, to me is one of, one of the most exciting parts of what we do because what happens is you have to learn how to grow algae. Okay, that's fine. And it's challenging and uh, it's got its, its uh, different challenges and nuances to it. And not that many people in the SPAT program actually get involved with al algae rearing. You can help out, but it's kind of like watching grass grow. Uh, if you get into it, you really get into it. Like our team is very into it now. And, and if you ever want to help out with that. Uh, conditioning and spawning. That's fun when you're there watching a spawn that actually works. Yep. <laughs> and if, if, if you're ever at a spawning and you sit there uh, for three hours waiting for something to happen and it doesn't, as soon as you leave, they'll spawn. <laughs> and that happened again on Monday. We had a film crew and they're watching and they're watching and they're watching. And as soon as they left, everything went, <laughs> went wild. So that's the nature of that beast. Yeah. And then larval rearing is, is exciting when you're doing it because you can look at them under the microscope and see how they're progressing. And, and that's really uh, uh, kind of fun. But this post metamorphic seed culture talk that we're gonna give, and this picture at the front shows big oyster shells with little oysters set on them. That's called spat on shell. This is the part where you're turning microscopic little bug things into the actual critter that you want. In our case, we're gonna look at oysters. Um, and, and this is where you really see how successful you ended up with, with everything else that you did beforehand. So we're going to go through this. Now, just as a, uh, a kind of reminder of how it works, you have adults. In this case, this slide is showing uh, what looked to be uh, Midalis gallo provincialis, or the, uh, some kind of horse muscle. They, they look like a big, they might be our crick creek muscles, the, uh, the ribbed muscles, you see the bissel thread, but you have a male and a female adult, and they're going to spawn. In the case of in the, in the uh, hatchery, we would have been feeding these adults and keeping them at a temperature so that they, uh, they're going to spawn. Oh, who do we have to mute now? We might have to mute somebody. Should I mute all? I'll mute all. If anyone wants to talk, uh, just let me know you want to talk and I'll, uh, how does that work, Darcy? <laughs> there's a hand raising thing. Oh, there's a little hand raising thing? Okay. Uh, you just, uh, yeah, 
exactly. Or you'll just see someone waving. <laughs> okay, okay. I have you all muted just so we. So anyway, these adults are are uh, at a, a point where uh, they're going to spawn, and in nature they're going to spawn and give off egg and sperm in the water column. Uh, the egg will be fertilized by the sperm in the water column. And in a short period of time, it'll become its first larval stage, the trochophore. And within about 24 hours or less, it becomes this straight hinged veliger. We went through this last month. It rounds out today, just to let you know, we did a spawn on Monday, eggs and sperm. They, the, on Wednesday, they were all de-hinged villagers. And today when we drained them down, they were still de-hinged villagers, which is kind of interesting to me. If we come in on Monday and they haven't rounded out into this umbinate villager, then something has gone wrong. This very diagnostic straight edge on the larvae is what we call a straight hinge or a de-hinge. It looks like a D. Velager, and it should come out of that in a couple days. So we're going to be looking at that. They start to round out, and they, as they keep growing, you're going to get to the last larval stage, which is called a pedivelager. In the case of an oyster, it's called an eyed pedivelager because there's an eye spot. And we're going to talk about all of these things, all these diagnostics on how you can tell that they're about to do this part, which is undergo metamorphosis. And what happens when the larvae undergo metamorphosis is really fascinating. It's so fascinating that I spent way too much time in grad school studying it. So you're going to see some, some of those slides. That's what I got my thesis on is this, this process right here, which I still to this day so that was, uh, let me see, I've been at Cornell 26 years in grad school. So it's like 30 years I've been dwelling on this. And still, it, every time I think about it, it kind of amazes me, this process. So this is what we're going to be looking at. Metamorphosis and settlement into juveniles. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. Now, what happens here, this is, this is one of my uh, graduate thesis slides. This is what happens, which is really fascinating. The larvae, when it's a pedivelager, has this organ called a vellum, and it's a, like a little combo organ. It's, it's, it's highly ciliated. It's allowing these things to swim, but it's also what allows them to feed. And they're feeding, and they're feeding, and they're feeding. And you'll see this little foot sticking out, which is, we call it, they call the ped, the foot, so now you have a, a pedivelager and it's swimming around and it's looking to see if it wants to undergo metamorphosis. And I'm gonna preface this by saying that clams, oysters, mussels, all of these marine bivalves that we're interested in have this larval cycle. The only one that really cements and sticks permanently to something is the oyster. And if you think about that, it's, it's a pretty uh, final decision on its part to do that. A clam can undergo metamorphosis and then it's gonna dig into the sediment. And it will, if you've ever gone clamming, you'll see that you can find clams just about everywhere. You can find clams in kind of rocky, cobbly sediments. You can find them in black evil mud sediments. You can find them in sand. So they're not as discriminate about where they end up. Where, uh, and a scallop, now a scallop is a little bit more discriminate because it, uh, it has a, what's called a bissel thread, like the muscle has a bissel whole beard, like, like Armand there. And, and it will stick to things like, uh, well, the reed grasses or other things. And sometimes when you go into a muscle bed and you pull these things off, they're really holding on, you know, they're holding on. A scallop has a single thread 
and it'll stick to things like eelgrass or codium. And the reason for that is it wants to stay off of the sediments and not get sedimented in. It wants to stay away from bottom predators, these kind of things. But an oyster, when an oyster undergoes metamorphosis, it sends out a little blob of cement and it sticks to whatever it chose to stick onto. And then it's there for the rest of its life. So if it sticks on a rock, unless you move the rock, the oyster's on the rock. If you're in Charleston, South Carolina, and you look over like we've done it during these conferences and you go down to the waterfront and you look at the pilings and there's oysters all over the pilings, they stuck to the pilings, that's where they're gonna spend their life. So it, it, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty final decision. What's interesting is that this thing is swimming around and I have it in a circular motion because it can swim around. It goes down to the bottom and it senses the bottom. It literally, if this looks to you like a snail, that's exactly what it kind of looks like. It looks like a snail kind of snailing around on the bottom. Taste, and, and when you're looking under the microscope, you can see it's almost like it's licking or tasting the substrate to see if it likes it. And if it doesn't like it, it, it can keep swimming. It's still got the velum. It's a, still a pet of veliger. So if it doesn't like it, it goes up to swim again and it keeps looking around. But if it does like what it, it sees, it's going to cement and then it's permanent. Now, what I studied in, in grad school was this phenomenon. Scientists love to figure out what the heck is going on. And this circle here, where it's a pet of Elliger sensing the bottom, is called search crawl behavior. And it's a behavior. These things are behaving in a way that is trying to assess whether they like where they're going to set. And it makes a difference because let's say this is a, a, a pet of Elliger and it goes down onto the bottom and it's black, evil, oozy mud with uh, hydrogen sulfide in it. It's not gonna like that. And it's gonna swim up and try to find substrate. S keep in mind something about oysters. Oysters are not like clams. They can't go underneath the sediment. They're what's called epifaunal, above the, the, the sediment. Clams are in faunal, they're in the sediment. If an oyster goes below the sediment, it's going to die because it can't. It doesn't have a siphon to feed. It's got to. It's got to be above. So it 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 wants to choose that habitat, and so this is a behavior. And what's interesting about this behavior, when scientists were looking at this, they were trying to figure out what the what what facilitates this behavior. And a lot of folks that know me and have been with me for years know that I'm an avid fan of biofilm, okay? Uh, but what's biofilm? Quite simply, you're at your dock, you've got your, you've got your tumbler of, uh, uh, of six o'clock uh, cocktail, and you drop it overboard because you had one too many cocktail, let's face it. So there's your glass on the bottom of the dock, uh, off the dock. And you go and retrieve that glass three days later at low tide. And you pick up the glass and you notice it's all slimy. It feels really slimy. It doesn't matter if it's your glass, if it's your buoy, if it's a line you put in the water off of your boat, you pick it up and it feels slimy. That's biofilm. And researchers noticed that biofilm seems to be an attractant for larvae. So they melt it down, they analyze this biofilm. And what do they find? They find a chemical that is what's called a dopamimetic. Like it's the precursor of L-dopa, which is kind of fascinating if you know about L-dopa. L-dopa is a a, a neurotransmitter that does all kinds of interesting things. And there's been movies like Awakening with, with Robin Williams, who some say I'm his doppelganger, but I, now I don't, poor Robin Williams. Anyway, L-DOPA is in 
in a sense, a component of that biofilm. So the thought was, well, if you have pure L-DOPA and you put it in your, your culture of, of uh, larvae, will they undergo this behavior? And sure enough, they, that's exactly what they do. They go right down to the bottom and start crawling around. It's really quite fascinating. But this is, to me, even more fascinating. So L-DOPA is a, a neurotransmitter that is playing a role in this search crawl behavior. And then once it determines that it wants to metamorphose, it undergoes metamorphosis. And what happens there is that epinephrine dumps into their little bodies and causes irreversible changes that allow it to undergo metamorphosis and then at that time it cements and, and that's it. So now the thought is, well, if you give this culture pure epinephrine, can you get them to metamorphose spontaneously? And the answer is kind of, maybe, but it's a little more traumatic. And I, I did this for years and I came to the conclusion many years, not many years later, a couple of years of working at Cornell that you don't need these chemicals. You need to just do, be a good culturist and nature will take care of the rest. You don't need to add these. This was the thought that there was like a miracle drug that you could put in here to your larvae. And all of a sudden you would have what they called it in the literature, a cultureless oyster. You could get it to metamorphose on a glass plate and scrape them off. Well. If you know how it works with us, we do that anyway without adding a chemical. We do, however, encourage biofilm. So th this was a part of it. What's most important about this, however, isn't that, that you could use these chemicals to increase your, your, uh, your culture, but more importantly, what the actual things that are going on in nature with these critters, that you have this dopamimetic that's allowing it to search and find the right habitat. And this epinephrine that causes internal changes. I, I just find that to be fascinating that these little tiny critters have these pretty advanced neurotransmitters that, that are, are, are doing this. Other factors that can influence larval settlement some are physical, light and shade, surface texture, flow, temperature, salinity, these kind of things. You can, each one of these bullets was a study that was done to try to, in, to, 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 try to induce larval settlement. And again, uh, we're sitting in a position over time to fool around with any number of these things uh, experimentally. I, I really am not done with salinity testing yet. Uh, we're pretty good with temperature. We know that a higher temperature, they seem to set better. Water flow, we always are providing. Surface texture is one that I'm playing around with. I just did an experiment with some different shells and setting on different shells. So we can talk about that a little bit. This light and shade, um, I actually did not shade the last batch that I underwent metamorphosis with and they set just fine. So there's questions about this one. Uh, some other ones that are biological, here's your biofilm, pre-fouled surfaces. I love this gregariousness. So oysters are gregarious. They all like to hang out with each other, okay. Adult tissue extracts and shell matrix proteins and these things. This is what I just played around with with an experiment. And the reason why the, 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 the thought of this experiment was this. We do, we not SPAT, but Cornell does a big project in setting oyster larvae on shell, SPAT on shell. And what they're doing, if you ever come to the Marine Center and you see these big piles of shell all over the parking lots and everything, 
don't come with your bucket to steal them for your driveway because they're there for a purpose. They're there. They've been baked in the sun for a couple of years. We, we palletize them, put them in a big tank, throw the larvae in and set them on shell. And we're going to look at that uh, later on in this talk. But the problem is this, this is what the problem, according to the project it's going on, they're saying, well, you're getting good settlement on your shell, but you're getting like a hundred oy oyster larvae to set on a shell and they outcompete, and you only end up with 10. So it's not very efficient uh, because it's a big shell. So what I did uh, was I took slipper limpet shell off the beach and scallop shell and, I, uh, and I'm looking at the different setting rates on the shell because those, the scallop shell, you can really kind of break it up and you can, you, you can get more shell out of it where you can't really do that with an oyster. And uh, same with the slipper limpet. But here we're gonna be looking at potentially different shell proteins of these, these different uh, shell types uh, that might make a difference. So uh, I'll keep you posted on how that turns out. Now, what happens is this, uh, depending on the species of the shellfish that you're, that, that you're growing, they have different, uh, different, uh, 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 characteristics when they're going to be ready to undergo metamorphosis. And when you're growing these things, you really have to know what those criteria are, especially, well, for all of them, uh, because of this. It's quite simply, you're growing these larvae and every drain down where we're draining down the tanks, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we pull the plugs on these larval rearing conicals, we collect all the larvae and they've been swimming around. When they undergo metamorphosis, if you weren't ready for them, they set all over your equipment. And this actually happened during this experiment that I was doing with these different carpidula and, and scallop shell. I had them in big, big containers, silos with a screen on the bottom and a downweller and all this stuff. And I just emptied the tanks today. And, and in one of the conicals, there was clearly a way of larvae getting out of this contraption. And at the bottom of the conical were like a thousand set oysters right at the bottom of the cone, right there. They, it, the whole cone looked black with set oysters. And what's interesting about that is I know exactly why they were down there because that's the part of the conical that's the hardest to clean and that's where the bio, there was more biofilm and they go to that like a magnet. So if you want them to set all over your equipment, you can get it to happen, okay? Folks that have been with me for a while know that if you put them in these containers, they set on the sides of the containers, like the setting trays and the silos, you'll see little bumps. They look like 36 grit sandpaper. And those are all little oysters that have metamorphosed and glued to the thing. You can take them off. They're, they're just one day or two days and you can, you can easily get them off. They become a cultureless oyster because now they, they're attached to nothing and they'll grow to be a perfect single oyster with no attachment on them. Okay. So to avoid that, you have to know certain criteria. For instance, in an oyster, when you're, when you're collecting your larvae and you size it, when it starts to retain on a 210 micron screen, they're of the right size to undergo metamorphosis. In a clam, it's 150 micron, same with a skull. Another diagnostic is this eye spot. Now, if we had a really super, super high tech laboratory and a bunch of crazy, crazy individuals. We've got the crazy individuals, but we don't really have the high-tech lab. I would, I don't think you can find in the liter literature anywhere that tells you what the eye spot is. Okay. The eye spot 
of an oyster is very, very obvious. You're looking at this larvae and it's got a black dot, like an ink spot, pink, in the middle of this larvae. Okay, scallops have one that's just barely noticeable and clams have no visible eye spot. Now it's a black dot. And what is the eye spot? Now, the reason why I say if we had a high tech lab and crazy people is I bet you we could prove that the eye spot is a concentration of something. Anybody have a guess? Raise your hand. <laughs> what that what that black might be? I'm going to say it's melanin. And the reason why I'd say it's melanin, besides that we know melanin is a black pigment, is melanin is a precursor to dopamine. So it's, it's very possible that the eye spot is, plays a role in that search crawl behavior in oysters. It's not in clams, they don't need it. They don't search crawl, they don't care where they go. Scallops kind of do. And I always thought, well, scallops kind of do. How come they don't have an eye spot? And one year I looked very closely under high mag and there is a tiny eye spot. It, there is one in a scallop larva. But in an oyster, it's critical and it's there. So you're seeing the eye spot. Uh, you're also seeing it's not here. I don't know why it's not here, but the, uh, the presence of a foot. Oh, pre no, it's not the top. <laughs> presence of a foot all species. So you're seeing the foot, the eye spot, and the size. And when it says evidence on a, on a test strip, this is really quite interesting because I learned this trick from Dave Relier at Frank M. Flower and Sons in Oyster Bay. When he would do his last, getting close to last drain down, he'd always look at the there's a rubber stopper at the bottom of the conical and it's got the airline going through it. And he would pull the plug, drain the larvae out and look at the cork. And if he saw little black dots on it, it meant that the larvae were starting to set. And why were they setting on the cork? Because that's the part that you very rarely clean very well. And so it had a biofilm and it was well conditioned and they go to it like a magnet. They really are attracted to this. So that's something to keep in mind when you're trying to set, when you're trying to set shellfish larvae, you want to you want to condition all of your stuff and get it a little bit slime coated, and you'll get a better set. So uh, you know, I don't think this movie plays. No, I don't think it. Media not found. But what this is showing here, I could I could call it up. Uh, I think I showed it on the last last lecture, but I do have the movies on my desktop. At the end, I'll, I'll try to call them up. But basically what this picture is showing you is, this is a shell chip, which we call microculch. So here's a shell chip and here's the larvae. Here's the vellum. And he's gonna be marching along on this kind of sampling it. And if he likes what he sees, he's going to undergo metamorphosis on the shell chip. If he doesn't like it, he's going to swim away. Oh, and by the way, it is a he because these are protandric. Remember that protandric hermaphrodite, all oysters start off as male. So this is a he. So don't think I'm being sexist about this. It's just, you know. It's just the way it is. I'm sorry. And soon he can turn into a she. But right now that's a he. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to get into this. I spent way too much time. This is this whole recipe on how to get them to undergo search crawl behavior using pure L-dopa. And you make up a little mix for formula. You put them in there. And, and it's silly. But it does work. It's kind of fun uh, for, for scientists to look at. When I was finishing up my thesis, I called up all the shellfish hatcheries around the country saying, hey, do you ever use that L-DOPA and epinephrine? Oh, no, that was a fad back in the 80s. Nobody does that anymore. And 
I thought, yeah, I, I kind of understand that. And then I called Ab Lab in California and they grow abalone. And there's another way of increasing settlement using another neurotransmitter called gam gamma amino butyric acid or GABA. Okay, it's called GABA. And I call up Ab Lab and I say, you guys don't use that GABA anymore, do you? And he said, yeah, we use it every, every time we set abalone. So I thought, that's weird. So all the oyster guys gave up on using these neurotransmitters, but in California, they use it every time they set abalone. And the reason is because abalone, like we're, we were just mentioning that oysters like a biofilm and that's got a dope of mimetic in it that's kind of triggering them to, to undergo metamorphosis. Abalone have a very close relationship with red crustose algae because red crustose algae has GABA as part of it, gamma amino butyric acid. On the West Coast, these it, it's critical to have these this red crustose algae for good abalone settlement. And so that's a very tight relationship. And so when you're using, when you're taking them out of the natural system and in a laboratory, you have to kind of enhance it. So that's why they use the GABA. Just a little side note. Now, what's fascinating is once these larvae have decided to undergo metamorphosis, they undergo astounding change, irreversible change because of that epinephrine. If you look closely here, you can just make out the line and the size of the larvae. And, and if I call up this movie, you would see, this is a, 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 a film clip and uh, it never works on Zoom, but I can, I can share the screen on the, on the movie later. What it would show is this field of microculture. And right here, this is the oyster. This is the gill structure. Here's the gut. Here's the mantle edge and the shell. And here was the, here's the little line that showed you where the, the size of the larvae. And this is just one or two days later. So it's doubled in size in a day or two. That massive explosion of growth after that epinephrine dumped into its body. And the movie shows some larvae still swimming around, ones that haven't made the decision to set yet. At the time, it's not like they all set the same second. So that's what it looks like. And that's what we're looking at under this microscope a couple days after we've put them in our little contraptions. And again, epinephrine, and this one's really, you know, some of these chemicals, you can't, if you're not wearing gloves, I'm told that a lot of the researchers kind of ended up go, getting a bit loopy, you know, <laughs> because L-DOPA opens up some doors that maybe should have stayed shut some of the time <laughs> in some people. So I, I'm glad I don't do any of this stuff anymore. It's like a, gosh, it's like I'm a reformed drug addict, but it was me giving <laughs> these crazy chemicals to the little larvae. But I'm glad I've reformed. I don't do that anymore. I'm all natural now. <laughs> Okay. Again, here's this awesome photograph. And these aren't our, by the way, these are not uh, Crassostria virginica, but this was from the website, a website that really shows awesome post metamorphic shell growth. So here again, you can just make out the size of the larvae. You can make out a little outline. But here you can see literally one day shell growth. One, two, three, four. So this is maybe a five or six day old larvae. And the gill structure is, I mean, <laughs> you're still looking under a microscope, but to me, it looks huge. This gill structure, it's just a big explosion uh, uh, of, of oyster. 
Now, what we do, if anyone's ever wondering how we get oysters that aren't more, usually not more than two, like you can get two oysters attached to each other. And by the way, when you get two oysters that are attached to each other, uh, depending on how you're looking at it, that's how they underwent metamorphosis and set. Sometimes they'll set on top of each other and they form what's called a, a, a double or more. That's not the same as your oysters that are packed in your cages that grow shell on top of another shell. These are ones that have glued from day one and grow day one. Now, as, a, as an oyster gardener, there are one, two, uh, uh, there are a couple different ways that they do this. One of them I call rabbit ears. As they're growing, you could see that if you gently take them, you could pull the two apart and you'll get two oysters without ruining them. Some of them look like Siamese twins. You can't pull them apart because you're going to kill one of them. So you just have to let it grow. And when you serve them at, at your cocktail party, you eat one side and then you open up the other side and eat the other side. Um, here's a piece of uh, a piece of clam shell, just as like a uh, it was an example of, and, and I'll show you what that looks like when you put in a piece of, this would be considered spat on shell. This is microculture. This is ground up shell. I just took our oysters, our second batch of oysters off of the microculture. So I sieved it through a one millimeter screen, then an 850 millimeter screen, then a 600 millimeter screen, milli, mil, micron screen, millimeter, micron screen. And the culture is 500 microns. So whatever went through 600 is recyclable microculture, no, no oysters. And I looked under the scope, I found one oyster. It's like, nah, I'm not chasing you down. You didn't make it to 600 micron and now you're going high and dry, okay? But that's what it looks like. It looks like little shell chips and this is our silo or a setting, a, a setting silo. We also have white setting trays. And what we're doing is we, we're very systematic about it. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we did this and used too much culch. Now I, I, I have figured out for my, for us, the, just the perfect amount of culture. It's 500 milliliters of 500 micron microculture in a setting silo. You put that in there, then you dump your larvae in, they're going to crawl around. And I say they all, each find their own private Idaho to, to metamorphose on. And so when you look at your oyster and it looks like it wasn't set on anything, look really closely at the hinge and you'll see a tiny, tiny white dot of shell. That's the microculture that it's set on. So it actually did set on something. If it sets on, by the way, if it sets on the, on, on the plastic, you can wipe it off and that one won't look like it's set on anything. That would be what we would call a cultureless oyster. Oh, look at that crew. Hey, we got Armand here. We got Otto here. Oh, we're, I don't know how Ed's doing. This is a very old slide. I love these old slides. Look at Armand hasn't aged a day. He just grew a beard, but Otto hasn't aged a day. <laughs> I'm not in the picture. So here's our, this is how I did uh, the last batch. We have a tanks and setting trays and, but I did the last batch exactly like this. There's a silo in here. It's being hung in the conical. There's an airlift tube. You've got a screen on the bottom of this. You put your microculch down in, you throw your larvae in and you feed them. That's a nice little setting silo in a conical. And I know it still works. It works just fine because we just did a batch. They work great in the setting tanks too. Two ways of doing it. But the point is, instead of a million larvae being in this hundred gallon tank and swimming around and setting all over the thing. And then you have to go inside with a scotch fright and get them off. They're in this contraption here, all corralled and you can control it better. You can, you can control it quite well. And so they can't get out of this because the mesh might be 
150 micron and the animal is 210. So it can't get out unless it overflowed. And, uh, and it's getting flow from the airlift and it works just fine. Uh, for scallops, it's a little different. Uh, we use ambient flowing seawater uh, in filter bags and we're gonna be working with scallops uh, this year. I say that every year, but this year we really are going to be uh, helping out with some scallops. So here's some more downwellers in a set tank and there's all these airlift tubes in the tank and different, different things going on. Picture of the airlift tube works by having an air line on the bottom of this PVC. And when you turn the air, it actually draws the water up and into the, in, in, into the contraption there. That's an airlift tube. Very expensive piece of equipment, as you can see. Okay. Now, uh, okay. Remote setting techniques. This, I just want to show you this because actually, this experiment I did with the shell, we now have all this larvae set on the shell, and we can play around with that shell. We can take that shell out and plant it in different creeks and look at it. Uh, I would like to do more remote setting. It's not what we do for the SPAT program for your oysters. Because can you imagine being a SPAT member and you come to get your oyster seed and I hand you six big oyster shells with little dots on them and say, here, here's your thousand oysters. Now go, go away. Uh, the program wouldn't last very long. But setting, sh setting larvae on shell it's really quite interesting for adding oysters to different creeks and habitats. You need structure. You can't take your single oysters and just, you can throw them on the bottom, but you have to be a little careful because, you know, remember if you're a SPAT member and you say, well, I'm doing this for the environment. I don't eat oysters. So we just throw them out at the end of, you know, if you live on a creek that has black evil muck, you're, you're saying, here, go free, live long and prosper, and they sink into the mud and die. I mean, you have to know how you're planting your seed when you go to plant your seed. So for enhancement reasons and building reefs and things like that, you set them on bigger shell. It becomes the habitat. And you need you know, this equipment here, a setting tank, aeration, medium, water, heaters, algae, larvae, and some experience and luck. So I'm gonna show you. Here's, a, uh, here's an example, that's Beth Walton. I don't know if you remember her, some of you might remember her. She was at uh, Mass Maritime on the Cape. And here's a tank, very similar by the way, to our head tank that we use now. And that head tank that we use for our hatchery was one of Greg's old remote setting tanks. We have a second one too, and we might set it up just for doing some spat on shell. Inside here are bags of shell. You put the bags of shell in there, you heat the water up, you aerate it, you dump the larvae in, the larvae set on the shell, and you have spat on shell. Here's how they used to do it exclusively on the West Coast, was the entire ac aquaculture uh, technique because you see on the West Coast, you were remote. I mean, this looks remote. I think in the distance there are like waterfowl. I don't think they're buoys or anything. They're just waterfowl out in like Washington State or, or Oregon or, or Northern California. And they're remote. And what these are, these huge cement troughs. I mean, you can see by the size, here's a guy standing on one. You can see how big they are. The serpentining here are, is the aeration and the heat. They'd fill this stuff up with, with water. They'd turn on big propane blowers that heated up these steel pipes that heated up the water and, and generators to run air and literally palletize with forklift trucks shell in here, dump millions and millions of larvae in each one of them to get spat on shell 
because that's how they were culturing their oysters. It's changing now. You know, uh, this, this guy, John Finger, he's stolen all of our ideas and now is doing all of it at Hog Island. You know, they grow in our oyster, in, in mesh bags, in, in, in Vexar bags and single oysters and the whole thing. But that's not how it used to be. Here's what you do when you're a, a research scientist. You put on your Playtex living gloves, notice, and you put them in this little thing. That's very hard to scale up how to do this. But here's West Coast. Here's your shell bags being offloaded onto the flats. You take them out of the tanks, take these shell bags and just lie them along the banks until they got to be looking like this. So here's your bag with the shell inside of it. And each one of these is an oyster, 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 oyster. So there's, you know, 30 oy set oysters on this one shell. And what happens over time is they look like this, a big, ugly clump of oysters. Now, again, if we were spat people and I hand handed you, you know, 26 clumps like this and said, here's your oysters, go at it, you know, whatever. But on the West Coast, th this is how they did it. And they'd literally, the, the technique for here is you have a masonry hammer, for God's sake, and you're clanking them away and you're getting, you know, trying to separate them without killing them and getting them apart. And remember, the, I said about competition, how many of these are going to make it to market size before they, you know, size themselves out but this is how you would build a reef in a way you would you would do this and and hope that it kind of expands outward over time so it's a quite an interesting thing that i'd like to do a little bit more than we do and and we do have the capability of doing that now this is an interesting set of spat collectors these are called chinese hats and i i, I recommended this to uh, my boss he was trying to figure out another way of setting oysters and what these are is a, a pvc bar with a bunch of plastic rings that look like hats and stacked up like like candy necklace almost and dipped in cement and do they catch oysters oh baby I guess so. If you're in the right area, these are just dangling off of a trestle. And, you know, where we are, it might look like this, but none of them are oysters. It's everything else that's set all over it, barnacles and, and everything. I mean, but here that, so you would take the hats off and twist them and the, and, and the, the thin layer of cement would break off the plastic and you would get your oysters and you'd put them out on the on the flats to grow. So I love this because I took this from online, but I call this the Leonardo da Vinci spat collector. I mean, it looks like six barn doors, almost almost like uh, the 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 museum, the 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 uh, what's that museum called down the road here? The, oh, uh, the <laughs> what else? The Parish Art Museum. It looks like a six Parish Art Museum roofs with a big cement block and a big log as a float to catch, you know, who knows how big this is, uh, but it looks big. I like to think of this as being like the size of a barn roof. And how the heck did you get that in here? I also think that this looks like a little seagull that's been cemented by some mafiosa cemented the seagull to the block and he's underwater. But uh, if you've ever want to read an interesting uh, ar archive of spat collection in France, it's called The Oysters of Lac Maria Care. And, and it's, it's a story of, the, of, I think, written in the 30s or 40s. I have a couple copies if you want to borrow one. And it's written about the Brittany coast and how they would all go out and put the tiles out to catch the oysters. And it's a kind of a, a, a nice little read. Uh, this is a scallop spat collector, our buddy Jeff here showing the scallop spat collector. These you can put out, we have these in mesh bags and you put some Netron in it and you hang them off your dock in about, uh, you know, May 20th-ish and you look at them in June, 
July, 4th of July, and you might find that you have wild scallops set in here, the, the spat collectors for scallops. The larvae swims through the mesh and, and then finds this other mesh inside and, and metamorphoses inside the spat bag. And these work. We, we, we've been doing a study for since 2004 of looking at wild spat collection and you know, scallops are in peril again. After all these years and we were doing great, they're in a different kind of peril, but we're still doing the research and, and the spat collection and the culturing and all that. It's just very frustrating that the adults are dying before harvest. So, you know, we, we, we there's a bunch of research that's been funded to look into what, what's going on, but we'll keep moving with the scallops. Uh, I throw this picture in because this was a group in the Westport River, and it, were, it was this group that got me to think up the SPAT program. And I think Otto and Armand, who used to come to lectures and hear about this guy, Wayne, Wayne, uh, I can't remember his last name, but Wayne used to give these talks about the Westport River and the SPAT collection. And they, were, they had the whole town going out to do this, but unfortunately, every year that's about all the scallops that they would get and so they decided to build a hatchery and then they went bankrupt and that was the end of the program so it was a a bunch of interesting lessons for me uh on community involvement was the one that i took home and and we've been running with that for 20 21 years now and it's it's great i mean you have to be careful what you're capable of doing with the community. If you don't know how to build and run a shellfish hatchery and you've never done it before, don't sink your $2 million of fundraising into it to go bankrupt because you get a lot of angry people. We did it the opposite. We had the hatchery. Now all we needed were the crazy individuals that wanted to learn anything about it. And boy, you know, people say, when are you gonna retire? I'm like, retire i gotta i gotta be in my 90s to retire to keep up with my crew so uh you know it's been great it's been wonderful and it makes me sad looking at those pictures because they were a good group uh and and it fell apart and when it fell apart it was done you never hear a single thing about it again and that's not how a program should be now uh Whenever, whenever we're looking at what we do at SPAT, we always kind of try to look at it two ways. What happens in the, in the laboratory? What happens in the hatcheries and the nurseries and all of our crazy uh, uh, equipment that we have that we can control? And that's a lot of fun to learn that because there's a lot of detail and you can, there's a lot of experimentation. I can't say I know everything about I'm learning something new every year. By, by kicking off ideas. So there's that part of it. And then there's the part, what happens in nature? Okay, because fundamentally, we're just trying to mimic and emulate nature. Nature's been doing this for such a long time. And now there's a different part of what goes on in nature because we're witnessing that nature can change quite rapidly. You know, like take the scallops, for instance, what's going on with the scallops? Is it that the water's getting warmer? Is it, is it the algae that they're feeding on? Is it predators? These are things that are changing in front of our eyes uh, with nature. And so you, you, you have to always be looking at both parts of it. So this one here is issues negating natural set. These are just almost almost like, uh, oh, what did I do? I went the wrong way. Uh, they're almost like uh, warnings for everybody. So what, what, what's going on with, every year you can have one of a number of different things happen, but let's take, um, Oysters are a tough one for Peconic Bay people to look at because we've never really had a lot of oyster set in Peconic Bay. And you might say, what are you talking about? There were, used to be this huge industry in Greenport in the 1900s.
But that wasn't wild set. That was seed being moved into Peconic Bay and cultured there. Now on the sound side, including Horton's Lighthouse, there was a big oyster reef that apparently was so, so sedimented over in the 38 hurricane and never came back. I think it's there. I think there's plenty of oysters off of the sound. We just, nobody's really looking for them as much as say uh, low hanging fruit, Mattituck Inlet. Mattituck Inlet has a lot of oysters in it. Okay, so there are places that oysters set up in. People always ask me, oh, you, you must have a ton of wild oyster set all over Cedar Beach. Well, there is some wild set. There's not a ton of it. It's not like the looking at South Carolina or, you know, you go down south or Wellfleet Cape Cod. You go to the flats of Wellfleet Cape Cod, everything's covered with oysters. It's on everything. They can't get rid of the things. And same with, with and again, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of folks that have been with me a long time. We go, went to a lot of conferences and we went to these low country cookouts. And the first time I ever went to a low country cookout down in, in it was actually in, uh, in Hilton Head, uh, where they took the entire reef and put it up on a grill and grilled the whole reef and then threw it up on a table with newspaper on it and you whittle these things out. And when I was, first time I was eating them, it's like, look at you killed all these tiny little oysters and we're eating these oysters, but look at all these ones that, that were only, you know, this big and you killed them. And I thought, what a waste. But what they do is then at the end of the party, they took that whole thing that everyone ate. You didn't throw any of the shells in the garbage. You put them in special things. They drove them back down to the water, dumped everything in the water, and it all comes back. And so, you know, that's great where you have it happening. It just doesn't happen where we are. But let's take clams or scallops in the Peconics. Some years, you're going to have a lot of scallop set. Some years you're going to have very little scallop set. And if you look historically, it's like a roller coaster of highs and lows. Now, what causes that? What, what, what's, what's promoting set and what's negating set? Same with clams. So some of the things that we have to be careful of is changes in the bottom structure or habitat. I mean, let's face it. We just went through how these things are swimming around and then they're going to go down to the bottom and they're going to set. And, you know, if you add a chemical like lead or uh, PCBs or uh, what, what's a, any, any, any one of these, tributyl tin, whatever it is, if you add that to the sediment, and I don't care at what level, because we, we have to be careful to say, oh, you know, one part per billion, that's nothing. But it might be nothing to us. But how about for a larvae that, that, that picks up on that like, well, yeah, something, something seems toxic here. So, you know, that or the change in habitat, the biggest change in habitat I can think of would have been the eelgrass for scallops. I mean, if, you, if, if eelgrass, and, and you can't really blame that on humans ripping out eelgrass, there was an eelgrass blight that really knocked eelgrass silly and it never really came back. Well, that's a change of habitat. So what do scallops set on now? Well, they're looking for a new habitat like codium or grass, different algae, that, and they can find it, but it's a change. I mean, back in the day of, of a lot of eelgrass all over, you could have a lot of scallops. Changes in the bottom sediment, we just mentioned about these chemicals. Did you know, this is an interesting, I bet Howard Reisman knows this, there's only one documented invertebrate that has been shown to get cancer. Did you know that, Howard? Oh, you're muted. Here, I'll unmute you. Hold on. Hi. Uh, hold on. Hi. Hi. Hi, buddy. Good. So, so you're a doctor of all this stuff. Have you sure, heard? If it, if it has, if it has gills. 
Oh, okay. Yes. Well, this one has gills. Oh, well, so, I really, I should have been more specific, but go on. Uh, okay, so what's interesting is that way back in the day, uh -huh. they discovered that Maya arenaria, mm -hmm. which is the soft shell clam. Yep. They were finding soft shell clams in super toxic, like Raritan Bay that had hematopoietic neoplasia, which is leukemia. It, it, it's a blood cancer of, of Maya and it's documented and it makes sense. These things are in the sediment. That is their whole environment. And if they're being surrounded by heavy metals, there's a good chance that they could get, pick up a, that, that toxin. And so that's been documented. Uh, Hematopoietic, look it up on Google if you can remember hematopoietic neoplasia in Maya arenaria. Everyone got that? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, that's a change in the bottom sediment chemistry. And it can affect things because they're literally immersed in their environment. Changes in seasonal algal composition. I tell you, we, Back in the day when I, when I wrote this down here, it wasn't such a big deal. It's becoming more and more of a big deal. And we know, again, we talk about in the laboratory, we're always at the mercy of algae and what they're eating. Is it good? Is it this? Is they getting enough of it? Are you getting too much of it? We are all, anyone that lived on the Peconic Bay for any amount of time know very well about brown tide and what that did, and that was a change in seasonal algal composition. So uh, harmful algal blooms, they keep coming up, they go down, they go this, they go that. Uh, and so that's something that can really make a huge difference. One of the reasons why it can make such a huge difference in all stages is if the adults, hi there, there's Judy. Uh, it, if the adults aren't feeding well because the algae is bad in the spring, then their, lar then their eggs quality won't be good and their larvae won't be good. If the, in the case of brown tide, the larvae couldn't eat Ariococcus angiofregeferens. And so that's the end of the larvae. So this is a big deal here, okay? Uh, changes in, you know, again, back 20 years ago, saying changes in seasonal water temperature are nothing like what you think of in the last three years, whether it's hype or not. The thought of climate change or global warming or whatever you wanna say, if the water temperature increases by one degree Celsius, it doesn't sound like a lot unless you acclimated over the last 20 million years for a certain temperature range. And then it's a big deal. And we're gonna see this happening. We're gonna see species reacting to significantly warmer water temperature, even if it's for, I mean, this happened two years ago, I would have blamed the scallop die off on, on really hot water temperature right after a spawning event. That's what I would have thought. Now, what happened last year? It happened again. Was it the same thing? Is it other things? Is it a virus? We're looking at it, but this water temperature is something we have to pay attention to because the marine system is very, very keyed in to a range of water temperatures. I mean, we're getting cow nose ray now. We didn't never had cow nose ray because the water temperature got too cold. Now, two years ago, I caught a, a juvenile queen angel fish at Tiana Beach. That's supposed to be in Florida. Now they get, they come up on the Gulf Stream or the, the uh, mid-Atlantic current, whatever. And so that might not be atypical, but uh, it's just interesting. Lack of ample brood stock. Well, that's overfishing issue uh, or otherwise, but you, you know, to get good stock, why is there so much oyster set in well fleet? Could be because there's ample brood stock. Or it could be, you know, all of these things coming into play probably is all of them. But I mean, we're, us SPAT members, we're, we're growing a lot of brood stock. So you would, you know, 
But if you have none, you're not going to get any set of. And this pollution and toxins, there's no question that we don't want to exacerbate uh, any, any changes, especially in this bottom chemistry because of stuff we're dumping in the water. So here's some uh, potential negating natural things. In the, in the, again, in the hatchery and the nursery, we're always trying to optimize. And what is optimal? Well, you can only figure that out experimentally. So we're working on it. We had a great year. We have a bunch of millions of oyster seed right now. So we're gonna have, a, we're gonna have an excellent year. I think we've learned a, a lot of very interesting tricks about larval rearing. I, wanna, I, I would like to work uh, maybe even on this upcoming batch of setting larvae in lower salinities because anecdotally, I'm, I've always been told and have read that the prolific seed beds that they used to get all the seed from back in the turn of the century for Greenport were in more brackish water. So I wanna look at that. We looked at it one year in the spat shack, but unfortunately we we're messing with the salinity for larval rearing. And that's not, that wasn't what we should have been concentrating on. We should have been concentrating on lower salinity at setting. So we can readdress all of that stuff. So I'm going to, how do I unmute all of you now? Let's see, I gotta, in case you have questions, let me see, oh, uh, unmute, where's my unmute button? Uh, 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 uh. Disable, where is it? Unmute, that was the last slide. I guess I could, oh, here we go, unmute all. Uh, huh. I can hear you, Kim. Yeah, how did I unmute? Oh, oh, hold on. I just have a blank screen, though. Oh, well, hold on. I'm going to stop it sharing. Never, never looked any better. There we go. And let me unmute all of you. Uh, uh, allow, help me, Darcy. Ask, uh, make, uh, allow. Huh. Oh, uh, mute all. How do I unmute all? Eh. Wow, that's cool. I can, I can, uh, oh, here we go. There, now you're unmuted. If anyone has any questions, like how do you unmute everybody? <laughs> Don't ask me that one. I just figured it out. And uh, But if anyone has any questions on anything here or, or anything to do with, uh, you know, as far as if, if there are new members here, and you're wondering, what the heck did he just spend uh, an hour talking about? I didn't understand a word he said. Of course, that's how we run the program. Uh, I'm supposed to think I know everything and you're supposed to think that uh, you're gonna learn it all. Uh, no, that's not how it works. How it works is we just have fun with this thing and we're around year round and you know, spring is in the air, we're going to be kind of coming back alive on our Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Uh, I, I think I, we're still not out of COVID, so we're still doing restrictions. And, and if you want to come by, just drop me an email. I put you, uh, I, I make sure that we don't have 100 people there at any given day. Uh, and um, oh. hey, Andrew Lowry. Hi. Oh, oh, Kim? Yes. Hi. Well, I have a brief report from, from uh, Coxon's Point Shellfish Hatchery in oh, North good. Uh, we have a pretty good set of oyster larvae now, and um, uh, we're raising them on. Uh, I'm hearing an echo, but I'm raising yeah, them. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to mute Jane's iPad. She did okay. that before. Yeah. So, so we've had success raising them on uh, ISO and uh, and pavlova paste, uh, supplemented by some live tet, and uh, they're doing okay. Uh, I I recall some years ago we experimented with paste exclusively and it didn't well let it. me ask you let me ask you a question uh, did you feed them to did you feed the paste this batch to the larvae from the beginning or was it later larvae that you got no no from the very beginning from the very beginning you did mm -hmm. you did uh i did the yes the the pav and the iso right have an iso uh, concentrate right from the beginning and you did well with it yeah uh, when you yeah we yes yeah, sure we 
uh, it is kind of, obviously we diluted it, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, yeah, but well, it that's is great, but that's it is great. concentrated, right? It comes in those. Uh, no, you know, yeah, yeah, those... yeah. No, I'm very familiar with it, and we're actually using using it for our post set. But yeah. uh, that's good to know that you actually got uh, oysters to set from feeding larvae a concentrate right from the get go. Right, and and we're, and we're yeah. now feeding those set ones with the, you know the once again still with the the paste and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. some pet. No, if you well, can it, get it, them, if you can get them, if you can raise the larvae on the on the paste, yeah. then uh, that that's the tricky part. After they set, they'll mm -hmm. eat it all day long. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's it's affordable and uh, that's important for us. It, it it is affordable. It just has to work. And so sure. you keep doing that, and you should document it. Uh, I I always thought that there's a very good chance something that you might be interested in. By the way, is growing a limited amount of live ISO or PAV to add along with. The concentrate and here's my half-baked theory that the con the paste actually gloms onto the moving algae cell and becomes a better target and doesn't settle out so fast so uh, not it does, might not even need to be a 50 50 mix yeah. you might be able to use 25 percent live 75 percent paste and get some interesting results so I'll work with you on that if you want, Howard, because I'm still Well, you, well not, not a bad as my invention. We get a lot of help from Barley, uh, yeah. Barley Dunn. And so uh, we yeah. rely upon him uh, for guidance. Excellent, yeah. yeah. Good, good. Sure. Anybody else have anything? Or or did we start the weekend? Start your engine. So, so spring is coming alive. Next week, we should be uh, moving to some ambient water. Uh, we do have some overwinter seed uh, for, for newcomers that we want to spike and get them going with their garden. So don't be strangers. I hope everybody has a great weekend. And uh, my email for folks that don't have it is kwt, the number four, at cornell.edu. And I'm sure everybody had a pen and wrote that down that didn't have my email. But you can always find us. Just Google CCE Suffolk Spat or Kim Spat or something Spat, and you you can get through. And and uh, it's great to see everybody. Thank you, Kim. Good. good. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Okay. Can I, can I just ask you? Yeah, hey, you Robin. Just... What's going on? Hi. Um, um, okay, it's kind of um, uh, late in the evening here at uh, the moment. So, um, um, so, uh, I mean, That's not my fault. I didn't move there. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, this is uh, yeah. This is good. This fits in well with with um, um, everything else. The so, yeah, um, um, yeah. where'd Robin go? What happened, Robin? Hi, Tony. What happened to Robin? He was asking a very important question and he, what happened to him? Did I mute him? Oh, there you are. Oh, look at that. The, um, you hinted there, so, so it's possible to, it's possible if kind of needs dictate to delay the settlement of SPAC. So. Say that one more time. It, 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 is it possible? Is it possible um, um, to it delay to delay metamorphosis? Yeah, that's a very you know that's an excellent question, and it was actually in the slide. There is a term called delay of metamorphosis, and what happens is, with a larvae, it's swimming around trying to find this area to set in in an oyster. And if it doesn't find what it likes, it swims back up. And that's called delay of metamorphosis. And it can do that to a certain degree. And then one of two things is going to happen. It's going to find what it's looking for, or it's going to die <laughs> looking. So it can delay for a while. It can delay. It, it, and it, that's what it's known as, delay of metamorphosis. How long is that delay for? I don't have a definitive on, on what they found in the research. But it certainly can be days because we know that uh, 
we can look at a cohort of larvae and you might have 50% of it that is set and the other 50% are delaying metamorphosis. And that can go on for a while. As far as, you know, a couple of things I didn't mention is that at metamorphosis in the hatchery, we see quite a bit of mortality. It's not like you have a million larvae and you get a million to set. You know, you'd be, you're, you're, you're perfectly happy to have 50% survival or 50% mortality. So what's causing the mortality? Is that delay of metamorphosis and they've run out of steam or they've run out of options? I'm not entirely sure, but there definitely is a way of inducing, I would say, a delay of metamorphosis. One way you would do that is don't provide any habitat and keep everything really clean. And you would in essentially delay metamorphosis like in the larval rearing conical. If you were to drain them down, you got them to a certain size, but you didn't want them to set, you wouldn't want to clean that conical and put them back in. And that would effectively delay metamorphosis because they're not going to really find anything that they want to set on. Great question. Wow, I should have thought of that. Did it answer, did it, answer it? <laughs> um, yeah, yes, in that respect, it, uh, um, certainly in that re the respect. But it, it, so in, in, the normal, in the normal course of things, you'd just work with the larval um, life cycle through to settlement and beyond and the, and the timing of such, but potentially you could Delay. Well, and, and again, in nature, I'm sure there's a lot of delay of metamorphosis because of, of whatever events are happening in nature. In a, in, a, in a laboratory situation, we're looking at getting larval settlement after day 14. So we're really trying to optimize to get everything to set day 14, 15, 16. Then they were done. Okay. So that's trying to optimize it. But in nature, I think you would potentially see a lot of delay of metamorphosis depending on the situation uh, 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 that's happening in the environment so yeah okay great thanks indeed They're good uh, question how long can hey, a larva how can long can a larva remain in the pedivelligar stage well again that would be that delay of metamorphosis that's the same exact thing that that what's happening is they are showing all the signs of wanting to set, but when are they setting? And so again, these things that can delay metamorphosis, some of them might be, you know, genetic possibly, or, or general uh, health. You would think, given the cohort and the way you're doing it, that they would be pretty uh, homogeneous and they would all just kind of last in there, but it just never, it's almost like the oysters that you're growing. They never grow at the same rate. You get some big ones. Some, so what's causing that? I'm not entirely sure. I do How know long? that that this delay of metamorphosis can, in, in a laboratory situation, can definitely go on for days. De definitely for days, because we can, we can, here's a perfect way of determining that. The other day, uh, we set oysters in, in these white trays, and you can see them all along the side. And so there they are, and I clean them off the side, come in two days later, and there's new oysters set all over the side. That was two days of delayed, in my opinion, two days of delayed metamorphosis, because they weren't there two days ago. These other ones were, they were setting. So why did these set on the side two days later? Clean them off, two days later, there's some more. That's four days of delay. So it can happen. I don't know how long it goes on for. I think I lose patience. It's like, you're done, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm good, you know, I'm, but uh, you know, interesting that way. Good? Have a good weekend. Okay, Tony, where's my cake? <laughs> Don't worry. It's Next coming. time I want a virtual cake. You could just hold it up. And you, yeah, you just oh, hold it up and say, this could have been yours. I'll bring you a real cake okay. soon. Okay, okay, good. Um, can I ask one, one yes. thing? Yeah, hey, Andrew, congratulations on, I guess, selling your house. Well, it's not congratulations, but 
I'm still interested in the Matatak Inlet, which is, I think, a super place to grow oysters. Yeah, and no doubt uh, Charlie, it. Charlie has given me, you know, three or four crates that I've placed carefully, and they're growing very fast. And I think it's a, you know, an opportunity. I mean, you know about it. Everybody yeah. knows about it, but it's it really is a great spot oh, with a no great doubt. incredible flow incredible flow and and i i would call it that sound water is just it, it's just it is a hot spot so what maybe we can find a way of of keeping you involved with the mattatuck inlet uh, you know i'm sure no, I'll, I'll be back in the in a in, in a few months but uh, and and i know all the spots on the inlet so there you go yeah. yep excellent and, and thank you Good, good. Good to see you. Good to see good. you. Anybody else? Dinner time. Okay. okay. We're going to sign off then, and we'll catch you next month. And feel free to come by the Marine Center. Let me know what you, everyone's up to. Good, good. Bye, Ken. Okay. Thanks. Cheers, Kim.